Hey, today we're excited to continue going with our Simply Christmas series. We kicked it off last week, and we talked a little bit about how the hubbub of the holidays can get in the way of some of the more important things. And so um, we've been in the middle of this series called Simply Christmas, preparing our hearts for the coming of King Jesus. And I just want to remind you that we have Christmas Eve services coming up on the 24th at 4 and 6 p.m. And on your way out today, you can grab one of these invitations and pray about who it is in your life who's open to the things of the Lord, who's looking to belong to a local faith community, and maybe Christmas Eve is the time that they would come with you and belong and maybe kick the tires on believing what it means to be a part of God's family. So pray about that as we move into the morning and grab an invitation on your way out and encourage someone to join us for Christmas Eve. Today we can continue the Simply Christmas series, and I'm excited to have a guest preacher this morning. Uh, Kathy Dreyer is our, our children's pastor uh, for our family of churches. She's specifically at Ridgepoint in Holland, but she also works with Zach, who you just met, and our other people uh, at Cultivate to help make sure that we are discipling our children and that we are caring for the next generation of the church. So Kathy's going to share with us this morning. Welcome and thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Good job. Uh, ask Zach what one of his earlier jobs was in his life, ask him, and, and you'll find out. I think it prepared him for the job he's going to do here. I'm not going to tell you what it was, so you have to ask him. Super cool. My name is Kathy Dreyer. Um, I am married to Jim, and together we have four children. Three of them are married. <clears throat> We're waiting for the fourth one to get married. He's not decided yet. And we have four grandchildren. You know, you can keep praying, right? <laughs> Anyway, it is an honor to be here, and I'm nervous. So let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in this moment, thank you for the opportunity to gather to worship you. And we're praying, God, together that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together would be pleasing to you. Amen. So this is the second in a series. Last week it was simply, what was it? Simply listen, listen yes. And Simeon was who was talked about. I love the, what, what I heard that Simeon was an active listener and that in his listening he knew the Spirit was telling him two things. One, that he wouldn't die before he saw the Savior. And I love the second one. While he's holding that baby, he knows that this baby is that Savior. Today, we're going to talk about simply believing. And we're going to um, go through this little story of Zechariah, who is going to move through doubting the unbelievable, to believing the impossible, and to finding that when he simply believes, he has a story to tell. And so do we. So I'm wondering... If any of you have seen the 2019, as it's called, Meyer Christmas commercial. Anyone? Yep, a couple hands. That's because you were here. <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> That's okay. What I'd like to do is have you watch it. I'm going to step aside. And they're going to show it to us. <laughs> Ah, it's cold out here. We gotta get this cold on, all right? Good. Ready to go. All right, let's go. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh, an eight tiny reindeer with a lamp. Mom said it was my turn. Why? I want to play. I want to play. Mom said it was my turn. Here you go. Oh my God, did I see Santa Claus? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Can I please have a cookie? Of course. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, no, thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. No problem. Sweetie, that's not Santa.
believe. What that commercial is trying to get after is your adult heart where doubt has layered on layer after layer. And it says, peel it back. Go back to that place when you were a child and it seemed simple to believe. I'm going to ask you to do something with me. So some of you have coffee cups. I'm going to ask you to put them down. We're going to shake out our hands. I used to be a teacher. We're going to take a deep breath. Let it out. That was for me. <laughs> and I am going to teach you the signing of the word believe in American Sign Language. So first you're going to take your dominant hand and point to your head. This is where your thinking happens. So point to your head. Then it comes down and you close your hands like you're holding something. And you hold it tight. So believing is something you know that you hold on to. We'll do that one more time. Believe. Remember that thought. So we're going to go into the story of Zechariah. I'm going to read it from my Kindle. You may follow along in your Bible, or you may simply listen. Go back to your childhood when you would listen to the stories that your mom, dad, or grandpa or grandma would tell, knowing this is the word of God. Here we go. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once... When he, Zechariah, was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of people were praying outside. Can you imagine the courtyard of Jerusalem, the temple filled with people praying? And Zechariah enters in. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. I'm going to pause a moment. He's going to name him John. This John is a cousin to Jesus. This John will actually baptize Jesus. This is not the John who wrote the book of John. That's another story. So the angel goes on. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Now he must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know that this is so? For I am old, I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe, my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Well, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did not come out, when he did come out, he could not speak to them. 
And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away my disgrace that I have endured among my people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, I find that Luke, as a writer, seems to be kind of an investigative reporter. Um, Let me read a little, just in verse 3 of Luke 1, it says, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, and I too decided to write an orderly account. He's investigative. He checks it out. He mentions conversations that he wasn't a part of, so he must have talked to people. In the time of... Let's see, when Herod was the king, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Herod as a king loved to build, and he did beautiful things to the temple. You can read actual accounts of how he built it, how he made it bigger. He used pure white marble for the walls and gold for the pillars. And I understand when the sun would shine on it, you would almost have to avert your eyes because of its brilliance. But King Herod also brings corruption to the system, and a man could actually buy his way into the priesthood. And that's why I think that Luke wants you to know that Zechariah is from a long line of priests. Zechariah has been born into the priesthood, and he marries a woman who can trace her ancestry all the way back to the first priest, who was Aaron. Now, priests at that time were divided into, like, work groups. They would be called to the temple to work for two weeks, twice a year. But the person who would go into the inner part, the Holy of Holies, was chosen by casting lots so that all the names would be put, say, into a jar, and you'd reach in and pull out one. If there were about a 1,000 priests in this work group, You could imagine that being chosen to go into the Holy of Holies was a -a once-in-a-lifetime thing. And the priests used the lots, the casting of lots, because this was allowing God to choose who was going. This is an appointment. So Zechariah goes in, and he goes in with the prayers of the people. That's what priests did. The prayers of the people at this time were, Savior, come, O come, O come, Emmanuel, save us. Those are the prayers. He walks into the Holy of Holies where they believe heaven and earth meets. And he puts the incense on the hot coals. The smoke arises, and that's the symbol of the prayers going up to God. And the unbelievable happens. An angel appears. Now, Zachariah's never been to the Holy of Holies. This is, like, amazing. And what does the angel say to him? Don't be afraid. You're going, your prayer has been answered. You're going to have a son. And he goes on to say that he's going to be a joy and a delight and the things he's going to have to do and the things he will do. He's going to turn people to God. He's going to make a way, a preparation for the Lord to come. And what does Zachariah say? Like, how will this be so? I want to sit back in my chair and go, Zechariah, you're a priest. You've got the Torah memorized. You've heard these prophecies. This is, you're standing in the Holy of Holies where heaven and earth meets, and this is an angel telling you, and you doubt it? It was the age of Nintendo. It was first new on the scene. And my boys were telling us that everyone had. Everyone was going to get them. This is the game to have. This is the best Christmas present. And no. 
no Christmas present. So they regrouped. Birthday list. I mean, we got an April birthday, we got an August birthday. Nothing. So they regrouped again at Christmas. Got the sisters to join in. One gift for four. Hard to resist. Nothing. We got another cycle of birthdays. This, this, come on, it's the best. Our friends have it. Nothing. Third Christmas. We slide a gift over to the boys. They take a little rip of the paper to unveil. None. <laughs> they step back. You know what they did? They stopped. They looked at us and went, no. Really? I think it's a very human thing when you are waiting and longing and praying and it doesn't appear. A year, two years, and you give up hope. And when it comes, you can't hardly believe it. I think it's a human thing. I wonder, when did Zachariah start letting go of the belief he was holding on to? Five years after there was no child? Ten years? Twenty? Did they stop praying that prayer? Zechariah is a priest. He knows the prophecies. He carries the prayers of the people. When did he stop believing that Jesus would come? Isaiah is a prophet 700 years before this time, speaking about the coming Messiah. Malachi speaks the same words as the, as the angel Gabriel. Had he forgotten? Had he let go? It was so many years. It wasn't happening. Expectation was gone. Zechariah, you're the priest. You know the Torah. You have it memorized. You're standing in the Holy of Holies. You should know. You of all people should know that this is true. And then I realize I have three fingers pointing back at me as I jab Zachariah's chest with everything he's failed at. I wake up every morning with a prayer of thanksgiving. I move through my day with devotions. I read the scripture, and it does fill me, and it moves through me. I have been in ministry for 30-some years, and I have felt every day really to be called to the ministry. I've wondered about stepping aside, and yet the calling always pulls me back. I'm a pastor, but I wasn't seen as a pastor. I was allowed to teach classes. I was in the worship team meeting. I would put worship services together and help with the content of the message and yet not seen as a pastor. I still remember the day when I was allowed to host a service for the first time. And I walked up the steps up onto the platform and I turn around and I'm struck with the fact that I know all of the people out there. I know them by name. I know what they're struggling with. I know what they're celebrating. That form of community just filled me and humbled me in that moment. And still, not seen as a pastor. So I decided to take some seminary classes. And I don't know, it just seemed like Life circumstances got in the way. My own personal doubts got in the way. Four children, middle school, high school, college, everything seemed to be getting in the way. And the church just couldn't seem to see me. And I remember sitting about three years ago in the back of a church, just going, is this? the way it ends? Is this the way my ministry life ends? 
And a voice said, have you thought about applying for the job of children's ministry pastor at Ridgepoint? Now, now the voice did come in the form of Kate Barman, who was walking through the church to say hi to me, and she mentioned that there was a job. But that's what the voice said, and that's what I did. I applied, and I was chosen to be the children's ministry pastor, and it's not just a title. People call me pastor. Ooh. I've done a couple of funerals and a wedding, and I'm going to let you in. This is my first time actually preaching as a pastor, right? Yes, in here. <laughs> waiting, hoping, longing, waiting, hoping. How about you? What is it that you are longing and hoping for and praying for? I want to encourage you to not let go. Keep praying with expectation. Know that God is alive and working in and through you. And there is one little thing. Sometimes what you expect doesn't quite come out what you were thinking. I'm kind of a late bloomer as preaching pastors go. <laughs> and when I think of Zachariah and Elizabeth having a baby at 80, <laughs> but it was a miraculous birth and a sign of God's unstoppable love for you. So Zachariah and Elizabeth have a baby. I keep thinking that must have been something. I mean, somewhere in their late life, they bring a baby into the world. And I kind of wonder, did they wonder how long they were going to live? How much were they going to see of little John's growing up? And I really wonder what Zachariah learned in those nine months of being unable to talk? Did he go into seclusion with Elizabeth? Did, did they teach each other a type of sign language so that she could understand him? And did she become his voice when he had to go out and talk anywhere because she understood? Did he re-engage with a Torah? Did he go over those prophecies of Isaiah? Did he start seeing and holding back on to simply believing that all of that was true? Did he draw up a plan and how he was going to teach John to believe, to simply believe, to hold on to the truth, to know that God answers? And sometimes it's a long time, but let go, John. Did he learn to do that? Did his mind still because his mouth was still? And did he hear God again? Was the word living and breathing again? The Good and Beautiful God is a book written by James Bryant Smith. And in it are lessons for you to read, and each lesson has a discipline or a practice, something you do for the week while you read the lesson. Lesson two is God is good, and the practice is silence, and I'm in the class. How hard could silence be? I mean, actually, it's just silence for five minutes. Psh, easy. No. <laughs> Let me give you a little glimpse of my life. So I go to bed every night with the radio on. It's on a timer, 60 to 90 minutes, and I fall asleep with words. The same radio wakes me up in the morning, not with an alarm, but with words, sometimes a song. I head into the bathroom to get ready for work. First thing, turn on the radio. 
I mean, it's just a couple of steps. I turn on the radio because I want to know what's going on in the world. After I'm finished in the bathroom, I head to the kitchen for breakfast. What do I do? Turn the TV on. More words. What's on the news? How do the children dress for school? You know, I got to be in touch. Got to be in touch. I go into the car to head to work. The first thing I do is turn the radio on because I want more words. I want to know what's going on out there, I guess. And then I get to work where I talk and there are words at me. And I go home and I turn the news back on while I eat so I'm up on the news. My whole life was jam-packed with words. So I took a deep breath and I started. No radio in the bathroom. I put my makeup on, no radio. And I moved to no TV in the kitchen while I eat breakfast. I even wonder now why I ever turned the TV on in the kitchen while I ate breakfast. We have a picture window that looks out over our property and I can see a deer walking up the hill, a fox trotting across the ridge. I can see the sun rise. My world of God expanded in that silence. In the bathroom, I could hear winter move into spring just by the bird song. Birds don't sing in the winter, but somewhere in the springtime, you start hearing them. And the turkeys have a certain kind of call in the spring. My world opened up to God in the silence. Let me encourage you to try that. I think you have an Advent calendar. And each day, there is a scripture. So this week, try it. Monday, tomorrow. Put some time that you're going to read that scripture, take a deep breath, and be silent. Now, we started with a minute, because let me tell you, after 30 seconds, I thought for sure I'd hit three minutes. So you have to be patient with yourself. Read the scripture. Silence. Try for a minute. If it doesn't work on Monday, try it again Tuesday. Try it again Wednesday. God is waiting for you very patiently. And I think you'll find in that silence that your mind grabs onto prayers and hearing God and peace seems to descend and clarity can come. Silence allows your mind to hear God. So give that a try. So we have that Zachariah's um, baby is born, and I need to just, wrong page there. So he gets his voice back, but not when the baby is born. It's eight days later, and the community, family, is arguing with Elizabeth, saying, because she has said, the baby's going to be named John. God named the baby John. And they're going, John? No, come on, Elizabeth, Zachariah, John? Nobody in your family's named John. Why John? That's like a silly name. It should be Zachariah. That's his father. And he's going to be a priest. No, no. There's some arguing going on, and Zechariah takes a tablet, and he writes on the tablet, his name is John, period. It's when he does that that his voice comes back. I think that Zechariah writing, his name is John, period, was a way of his saying, I believe what God has told me, period. He's holding on again to the truth. And when he states that, then his voice returns and he sings a song. And I want to read that song to you. This is how it goes. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. And you, my child, he's speaking of his baby, 
will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. To simply believe gives you a word of belief to pass on. To simply hold on to the truth gives you a voice and a reason to sing. I want you to try reconnecting with the God that's always speaking to you and expect, be waiting, expect God to speak through you. Believe in the God, the faithfulness of God in, from Genesis who created the world, who put a plan of salvation into motion when Adam and Eve turned the other way. And every word of the Bible is true, book by book by book. Believe that your story is a part of the whole story and lean on the stories of Simeon and Anna, Zachariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph as part of your history. And if you're new to the faith, if those names aren't familiar to you, I know that there are people in this room that would be honored to read those stories with you. If you don't have a Bible, I know they have some back there that you may take. I have one right here that I would love to give you. Your name, your story is here. I like the way Kevin, our senior pastor, puts it. It is at Christmas time that the world sings our song. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Angels we have heard on high. Joy to the world, the Lord has come, the song of salvation. I want to challenge you as you reconnect to God to simply believe and hold on Ask God to show you what to do. Are you in that long line at Meyer and you see the cashier? Ask God how you could pray for the cashier or the people in line. Is there someone that you know that's struggling in the holidays, that's missing someone they love? Ask God who you could write that note to. Maybe... There's someone that should come to the Christmas Eve service. Are you praying for that? Ask God to show you who that is and hand them that card. You are a part of the story. God breathes through you. You have something to sing. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And while they're setting up, I want to leave this thought. Jesus quite often points to children. He says to have the faith of a child. What would it be like for you to peel back the layers of doubt that adult disappointment can bring and come at the holidays with the heart of a child? that simply believes and then you pass it on. I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes open while we pray and you're going to sign with me as we do this. God, we simply believe. And when we start to let go, give us the strength, God, to believe that you who began a good work in each of us will see it to completion. Amen.